On the phone, it is a pleasure to welcome uh, back to the program the historian and author of, well, uh, Before the Storm, uh, about uh, Barry Goldwater and the unmaking of the American consensus, Nixon Land, the rise of a president and the fracturing of America, and his latest, The Invisible Bridge, The Fall of Nixon and the Rise of Reagan. Uh, Rick Perlstein, welcome to the program. Thank you so much, Sam. It's a pleasure, uh, Rick. I uh, and, and let me say up front, I have I have yet to finish the book, but I am enjoying oh, this. Up. I am enjoying this so much, um, uh, be, just because I think per- perhaps because um, it is the the era that is covered is I think when I was just becoming sort of conscious of. Of just things uh, from seventy three to to seventy six is covered in the book, but uh, remembering things like wacky packages, yeah, and um, uh, I don't. It was the wacky packages that really got me because I had totally <laughs> forgotten about those wacky patch. Wacky packages have hit a sweet spot, man. Maybe, uh, maybe some of your re- some of some of our listeners don't know who's going to explain what they are. Well, wacky pack. Well, you. Why don't you explain? You. Well, well, you. well, they they were they're like they were trading cards, and they were mocking. I mean, I mean, I, I, they were. Mo- well, that's the thing is, that I I don't think as a kid I, I had never thought about this, and that's that's what I hadn't really sort of why it was so great to sort of hear this thing reinterpreted in a way that I don't think I had ever interpreted. They were just basically mocking products that you would get, and it would just change the name of whatever it was, the toothpaste, and and mock it. But it really was part of, and and this is what. You, this era was was about in many ways. Yeah, questioning, challenging the pieties. Exactly, yeah. and yeah, and and not only were they trading cards, Sam, they were stickers. Yes, <laughs> and I call them the adolescent equivalent of subway graffiti. Right. So, like, I, I quote a, a school teacher saying, at the end of the year, she had to spend like a week just kind of scraping these things off the desks. And you know, it's kind of like I, I, I look Guilty. at sort of a lot of the seventies as kind of the way. That the '60s insurgent energies kind of like, kind of worked their way through the institutions of popular culture and all that, and that's one example. Another example is Mash. You know, like think of this TV show, in which the good guy was the guy who never followed orders and hated the military, and uh, didn't think there was anything different between the South Koreans and the North Koreans, and the bad guy was the patriotic guy. Indeed. And, 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 you know, I mean, it's interesting. I, I don't want to get off on too other tangent. I wanted to start this in a different way, but I was just, I think, too overwhelmed by excitement on the wacky packages. Uh, but it was, you know, it was, it was sort of, it was. That's the, what she said. Well, <laughs> the, the it, it, you know, I, I'm a big situationist uh, 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 fetishist. And, um, I, you know, it occurred to me. Situationist. Yeah, it, it, and it occurred to me that in some ways uh, the wacky packages uh, were were not unlike what was happening with the Situationist International street art, where they would reappropriate these um, these uh, uh, icons in a way and uh, deconstruct them in and of themselves in some way. But um, but but before we get there, let's let's start where I had planned to start because. There's uh, I, I want to address this, but I want to address it very quickly because um, it is, I think, more than anything else, it's it is akin to um, uh, to Al Franken being sued by uh, by Bill O'Reilly. Um, the the there has been an attempt by the right wing uh, to to taint your uh, your incredible. I, I, it's just an incredible achievement, this book. Uh, by by claiming that you have plagiarized by uh, restating uh, historical facts and um, uh, by a guy who is uh, Ann Coulter's publicist um, and who, you can't you can't make this stuff up and, and, and who who you cited multiple times but uh, in, in the book I mean I think uh, over a hundred times and, and what's and it's already, I think, been very. Uh, the charges have been thoroughly debunked. But in some ways, it is. There is. It, it's almost. It, it's almost a 
a, a metaphor for your book in some ways. Yeah, um, I've become a character of my book. It, indeed. And um, it is, I think there's, there's far more sensitivity uh, because you, your books, uh, your, your first two books were, were widely praised by conservatives even in terms of, uh, uh, of capturing uh, the rise of, or I should say, the exploitation the rise of the conservative movement, but was an exploitation, I think, of of, of sentiment that probably already that, that that has existed in American politics. And I think, you know, now that you've you've touched upon Ronaldus Maximus, uh, the, <laughs> the, the Saint Ronald Reagan, uh, right. they're getting a little bit more uh, upset about it. And uh, I hope that it has uh, done nothing more than to provide extra uh, publicity for your book, because it's something that I think. Uh, certainly uh, is uh, it, it's just it, it's a it, it's a great uh, a book and let, let's let's so let's talk about the book itself yeah, unless there's anything I mean, quickly, else you, you know I mean the best kind of summary about what's going on was um, by David Day and in, in Salon it came out yesterday so you know just go there you know read his lawyer letters read my devastating letter from my lawyers better <clears throat> better yet read the letter that he sent out to all his friends is actually his his public relations partner uh, sent to all his friends, asking them to join the offensive against me, saying that they can suggest tweets, that their problem is that I'm putting a new spin on Reagan. Okay, we don't have to get into details, but here's the amazing part, man. It's like I have this fantasy of advising the Obama White House and telling them how to deal with the right. And my idea is always figure out a way that every time the right says something really nasty and smearing, it boomerangs against them. So you remember that deal where, like, you know, every time someone smears you, you'll donate $100 to some worthy cause, right? So that's exactly what's happening, man. This thing has crazily boomeranged on this guy. Yesterday, my Amazon ranking was 20. Uh, there's a hashtag, buy invisible bridge, that people have used to kind of, like, cite the ridiculous stuff that's coming out on the right, there's this like national review piece uh, that circulates that, that tells some story about from ten years ago that I don't remember, saying I'm a lunatic and a jerk, <laughs> and um, so one guy told me he bought ten books just to piss off the Republicans. Well, that's fantastic. I'm not saying you should do that, um, but it, if you do, spread them out so my Amazon ranking goes higher. <laughs> right, and if you uh, if you do buy ten, uh, you know, uh, bring a hand truck because uh, you're, you're going to hurt yourself. There you this go. thing. Um, it, 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 it's a fantastic book. But Who's laughing in the background there? Uh, well, no, I've got a couple of producers here who, uh, who I can hear it. It's bleeding through, man. Yeah. Well, there, there you go. Um, and that's cool. That, well, they they just said that's what she said. So, um, all right. So, all right. Let's get to, let's let let's start with uh, the, the this era uh, 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 of seventy three and seventy six. And, you know, uh, like I say, I was uh, uh, about nine uh, to 12, I guess, uh, during that or nine to, uh, I guess, uh, seven to 10 years old uh, during that period. And yeah, I, I was born in 69. I was vaguely conscious of a lot of the things you're talking about, but I don't think I was conscious of, uh, of well, certainly not of some of them. But this was and, and you write in it, 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 it. This is what I think I've why I've enjoyed this book so much is that this is was an incredibly uh, tumultuous period for America. Um, go through this list of uh, uh, of right. things that took place, uh, ranging from right. uh, the terror. I mean, we had a lot of bombings. Let's start there. Uh, we had yeah, a lot. Yeah, that's a crazy one. Uh, there were. Uh, I think the FBI identified it was eighty three or eighty seven uh, terrorist bombings in nineteen seventy five alone, and and the most incredible one uh, was. Uh, in the baggage terminal at LaGuardia, the baggage claim killed like 20 or 30 people uh, at Christmas time. I mean, this stuff was going on all the time. And kind of the context for rehearsing all these bombings is people were terrified to have public bicentennial celebrations. They were afraid that the weathermen or the, 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 the Puerto Rican separatists would bomb it. And, 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 and I, I, you know, that's something that I just don't know that people are aware of. I mean, in, on some level, it, 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 it harkens back to 
the, uh, the just how uh, violent uh, the labor unrest was, you know, 100 years ago, uh, uh, 80 years ago in this country. And I don't think, you know, that people are aware. I mean, I, I mean, obviously, people older than uh, than us are. But uh, I certainly wasn't aware of it as a kid. Uh, yeah, I wrote about that a lot in the nation last year when I was blogging because every time there would be some hysterical thing like this crate when this crazy woman uh crashed into the barrier at the Capitol and two hundred uh sort of hazmat wearing police and keep uh, and, 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 and you know military personnel descended on her uh apartment. I made the point that when this stuff happened in the seventies, like we didn't suspend our civil liberties. We didn't go berserk like we did now. And and it speaks to um, where we were as a country in terms of of a uh, well. Let's talk about these other the, these other impacts before we sort of sum up the. Um, I mean, we're talking about uh, the return of of prisoners uh, of war from Vietnam, uh, Watergate, the oil embargo. You mentioned that meat prices skyrocketed at one point, and I. And I yeah, doubled I, in a month. I vaguely remember that when we just chicken all of a sudden became the rage in our home. Um, yeah, you know, you know, it was really funny. Um, there was a um, story in the newspaper about a woman who fed her uh, husband in it uh, without telling him a uh, horse meat, and the copy editor for the book said, "Hey, I remember there was an Archie Bunker episode about that." And like, lo and behold, there it was. You know. And and um, we had, you know, obviously like uh, Patty Hearst uh, during that time. I mean, w- was I remember as a uh, I mean, there was the uh, sum up the implications. Do you, do you want, wait, wait. Do you want to hear my first political memory from Please. the 70s? It was the first political argument I can never remember participating in. And it was a very famous thing because it happened exactly a month after Nixon resigned. Right. What was the famous thing that happened a month after Nixon resigned? Was uh, the. Mm. Stay there. Well, I was going to say the pardon of four, but that's not what I was talking about. Uh, in the kindergarten, we were arguing over whether Evil Knievel had intentionally pulled his parachute over the Snake River Canyon. Right. <laughs> I, uh, right. That, I, I, I didn't realize that was contemporaneous at that time. And, and, and so we had, um, uh, and, the, and the pardon obviously um, uh, happened. It was but a huge deal. It was really the beginning of our, our culture of, uh, letting elites get scot get off scot free for the crimes they commit. All right, right. Well, that's, that's you know that's that's a rank contra. That's you know no bankers going for jail going to jail in the financial crisis. Well, the other the interesting thing too. I mean, we, we raise the pardon. I want I, I want to get to that in a, in a moment. But 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 you describe. I mean, uh, the, the 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 totality of this sort of creates a moment. And and I think you you you, you cite. Uh, uh, Kant uh, at the beginning of your book in terms of, of 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 what the Enlightenment was. I mean, talk about where this was in the context of uh, uh, of the where the American psyche was at this point. That's right. Yes, uh, Kant his definition of, of of his definition of the Enlightenment was mankind uh, and uh, leaving its basically leaving its age of its enforced minority. In other words, becoming grown ups. Looking at problems in you know kind of serious and mature ways, and to me, you know, we remember the '70s is full of this awful stuff. But I'm very nostalgic for the fact that like you know Watergate hearings got huge rankings and uh, ratings on TV. People were sitting for hour after an hour after hour watching very complex, very abstruse constitutional debates about the most important issue of power in our society. You know, uh, we get the beginnings of the energy crisis, and people are really beginning to think hard about what it would mean to conserve energy, right? Um, we get, um, you know, the, um, the we lose the, the Vietnam War, and people are thinking hard about what it would mean for America not to be the world's policeman. This was good stuff. But one of the things I try and show in the books is, book is it was always kind of um, – that's, that was where the big 70s division started coming in, and that's where kind of the wedge for Reagan to enter was, was people were always, there was always, always other voices saying, um, stop running America down. Right. I mean, the it, it, it's interesting, you know, I, I've been spending a lot of time over the past uh, couple of years here uh, with uh, debating libertarians. And um, mm-hmm. the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, uh, I mean, I don't want to be over over generalized, but there seems to be sort of this mentality of 
of, uh, of a 17-year-old, 18-year-old, goes to college, um, and in dealing with sort of the complexity of, of life, settles on sort of a fantastical uh, uh, set of beliefs that, that sort of simplify everything and answer them. And you, you describe a period in American culture where, in the American psyche, where we are questioning the 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 essence of America and on some level it's like this was a a a a, a crossroads for America whether or not we right. could sort of accept that we were just you know yes a superpower but with all of the shortcomings of any other society in some level and it, it's sort of like we we it was a very raw time it feels like for the American psyche. Yeah, that was the debate that was going on. I mean, that's what I was, you know, reading all these historical sources and finding, you know. Um, there was a, a shouting match that broke out uh, on the floor of the uh, state legislature in Albany. Uh, you know, after the Vietnam War ended, um, one of the assemblymen wanted to have a kind of support our troops, yay America resolution. And another uh, assemblyman said, why should we be celebrating these people who are committing war crimes? I mean, that's pretty raw stuff, you know. Um, Jimmy Breslin, the columnist for the New York Daily News, you know, when all these POWs were coming home and they were holding this kind of patriotic festivities and having parades and, you know, uh, giving them testimonial dinners, Jimmy Breslin said, what, what is this all about? This kind of reminds me of waiting for these guys to come home, reminds me of waiting for uh, some guy I knew who was getting out of Sing Sing once. He said these guys were war criminals. They were bombing civilians. I mean, I can hardly imagine uh, something like that, you know, the nation getting away from uh, uh, getting away with writing something like that, let alone a, a tabloid. And, and, and so this this uh, sort of raw uh, uh, psyche, um, this uh, th this I guess these these sort of uh, these ambiguities. I mean, you talk about at one point uh, the bad news bears. Uh, yeah, I, I, in the book, and well, just tell people like what, what, what are we to garner from? And, and you know, we see this with all uh, the movies out of that period, where the mm -hmm. all these institutions are questioned. You know, like uh, things like right. Three Days of the Condor and yeah, Parallax uh, View, in the Parallax View, and um, these uh, this all the president's men, all the president's men. Um, it, but even bad news bears. I mean, w w you know, the idea of coach being just you know a total a f up. Exactly. Right, right, and and, and not only that, but uh, you know, the, the 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 sponsor for the team was Chico's Bail Bonds, and and it was like the, their slogan was "Let Freedom Ring." So it was kind of like the bicentennial itself was seen as this kind of phony, kind of wacky pack scam. And, and so the, it, 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 I mean. It seems to me that when you look at your 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 you know and I, and obviously you know I I've read so much of what you've written through the years um, in uh, in the nation and uh, the I mean uh, every publication uh, online but you know uh, but you have talked about these divisions that have existed in America and, and that they have existed in America at, at the very least for in, in in many respects as they exist now for uh, the past past hundred years at least uh if, right. if not if, if not longer certainly since the civil war and um that really what we see post the um the, the civil rights act is sort of a, a a new way of of formulating these divisions and a series yeah. of you write about goldwater and nixon and then ultimately reagan that each one of these figures began to exploit these divisions in ways that built upon themselves. Uh, mm -hmm. can, uh, can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. I mean, we got kind of three layers to the story, right? The first book about Goldwater, which you know culminates in the 1964 election, and Goldwater is all about this kind of mythology that if you're a capitalist and you're rich, you must have done it all yourself, and that you didn't need the government, right? So that's kind of the first division, right? That you know between the people who you know, are, are virtuous, you know, kind of uh, paragons of the free market and kind of the, the moochers who use government, right? The second layer is 
this Nixonian layer, this kind of cultural resentment between sort of people who consider themselves the, you know, red, white, and blue silent majority who just work hard and play by the rules and don't protest and get stepped on and condescended to and smeared by these kind of know-it-all liberals and bureaucrats, right? That's, uh, the, you know, that's, that's Nixon land, right? And then, you know, Reagan's, Reagan's uh, contribution to that is kind of dividing us you know, and kind of these things all map onto each other, like they're, they're overlapping, right? It's still the red state, blue state. But the division is between the people who, you know, quote, believe in American exceptionalism, right? And the people who have a, you know, our vision of patriotism. I mean, you mentioned, um, you mentioned uh, Al Franken before. He had a great line. He said, um, too many conservatives uh, love their country like a child loves his mommy, right? Liberals try and live our, love our country like adults love each other in these complex and rich uh, negotiations, these real relationships, which I kind of somewhere in the book call a, a higher form of patriotism that was being sort of articulated in the 70s. Well, you know, it's interesting that you mention that because, you know, I, I, I couldn't help but feel, in, in, and I am not as uh, Lake Offian as, as some others, um, but the the it really does feel and and and, and you write about uh, Carter too and I I want to talk about that, but there is this quality of uh, it, it, it's almost as if you know we we were we were children of of divorce you know we had these arguing parents for a long time and then during this period um, uh, in particular uh, the our, our parents split up and uh, those of us who identify um, uh, on the left and those who identify on the right um, sort of uh, uh, sort of uh, chose sides with the parents <laughs> and the type of relationship that we had you know I'm, I'm obviously oversimplifying here but it was as if yeah, my parents and, stayed together. <laughs> well, but but how did you know how were you know we at that time it felt like um, we were searching for some type of reconciliation and it could go one way or another. It would be one would be this sort of complicated understanding of ourselves as a country where yet we have flaws. Uh, and the other was that we are inherently flawless. And the existence of any flaws were necessarily, by definition, not part of us. Right, right. Introduced by alien forces, introduced by the other, right? That's, that's Reaganism to a T. You really got the book. I mean, you really kind of boiled it down. And um, we know which way it went, right? I mean, to me, you know, the book ends with the 1976 Republican Convention. But the real conclusion of the book is the bicentennial in which, you know, all the discussions of the bicentennial leading up to it, I mean, like, all these newspaper uh, editors and, and, and op-ed writers were like, do we even deserve to celebrate a national birthday party? You know, it's been such an awful time. You know, it's going to be dangerous. It's going to be hot. It's going to be sweaty, blah, 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 blah. Morose, morose, morose. And, you know, basically we planned this big birthday party and more power to us you know i enjoyed it <laughs> you know i don't think it was a bad thing did you but go the to the train really did the train come to you to, to i remember going on to like i think it was the the bicentennial train uh, that stopped right. in reagan Edmonton. loved the bicentennial train you know why he loved the bicentennial train because it was sponsored by private enterprise so yeah. what other country could do that right it's like we look at something that's like you know sponsored you know like a celebration of the country sponsored by you know general dynamics and we say oh my god this is awful reagan's like this is so idealistic <laughs> but you know so the bicentennial comes and goes and all the coverage of it is like it's it, the, the the keynote of the coverage is surprise you know that it's really kind of fun and it isn't that hard after all to kind of have this unproblematic knee-jerk kind of jingoistic celebration of america Right. And to me, that was a watershed moment. That was kind of like, you know, the opening curtain for Reagan's moment, you know, and then he didn't win that convention. But uh, he, you know, he obviously didn't become the nominee, but he kind of was kind of the, really the face of the convention. And he gave the speech that was sort of like, um, you know, brought I'm, now you didn't finish this. So I'm not going to tell you, but you got to read it because <laughs> he basically um, there's a surprise ending. Sam. Oh, uh, believe me, I'm, uh, I'm going on vacation. It is the uh, yeah, I will yeah. I'm, I will be on this. Uh, I will find out how it uh, how it ends. I guess. But for uh, your listeners, it's going to be a cliffhanger. Yeah. Well, and then I'm doing another one. I'm going to do another book that goes through 1980 and take him into the White House. 
And, you know, but Carter is a really complex character. I mean, yeah, it's really, I want to get to Carter in a second. Kind of, I want to get to Carter yeah. in a second because, but, but one thing that also stood out for me that, that I think really sort of exemplifies the, what the, the, the Reagan approach was. I mean, you cite The Exorcist in the book as the chapter yeah as people really like that one as well as as a, a a metaphor for what had happened to um you know our 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 our, our society as it been become sort of polluted in some way and yeah. and one thing that struck me too is that it, it, reagan really captured this notion of it's something outside of us that comes in that it's right that exactly demonic forces from without right and so it, it appears to be inside of us, but it really right. isn't. And right. it's something that can be exercised. And on some level, that's what he was was offering the country, was this sort of national exorcism, rather than sort of dealing with the fact that, you know, kids are complex. It really is right. just all we need to do is, you know, come in, drop some holy water, and we can, we can, uh, we can, we can deal with this whole problem. Right. Well, you know, it's not just dropping holy water. It's a tradition that, that heals the exorcist. I mean, the, the movie's amazing, right? Because it's basically they try and heal her with science. It doesn't work. There's this priest who kind of doubts his faith, and he's helpless. But they bring in this super traditional priest, and he's the one who's able to do the trick. And then, you know, and it's also amazing that some people say that the character of the mother is based on Shirley MacLaine. She's this actress. She's having, like, a liberal cocktail party, all this stuff. I mean, it's, it's, it's remarkable how, how dense the symbolism is of that movie. And, and how profoundly people react to it. It was it was the best selling movie at that time. It it outsold Gone with the Wind. And not only that, people reacted so strongly. I mean, they literally had um, and I mean literally, they kept kitty litter in the movie theaters because that would, what, was what it took to absorb the smell of the vomit because people were so grossed out and freaked out by it because the idea of a our, our little girls, our symbols of innocence being possessed by outside forces, whether it was cults or drugs or politics or whatever, was so close to the surface. But the last scene in the movie is amazing. Basically, the mother and her little girl uh, are kind of like, they, 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 they thank the priest, and they're dressed like they're about to go to a cantillion, and, and it's 1962, and the 60s have never happened. And that's what was exorcised in that movie. Is just getting rid of and, and 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 really that was very prescient on some level that that is that it, it picked up on what what the what would appeal to this American yeah, the, psyche. You know the movies, art. I mean that's how we kind of negotiate the dream life our, of our societies. You know. And and um, and 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 Reagan sort of provided that uh, answer, and it, and and much I think to our detriment, and and I think you, you, I mean that is the argument I think on some level of the book is that we are, we 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 had that, we were at that crossroads, and we right. just went down the, let's just ex, you know, let not 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 only do we exercise this with you know some hocus pocus um right. but also that we choose to perceive our problems in that way right in the preface i tell the story of uh uh the confirmation hearings of samantha power to be obama's uh, u.n ambassador and apparently 10 years ago or something like that she wrote an article about uh these various kind of sins that america committed in the past that we need to kind of think through and uh, in her hearings, uh, Marco Rubio, that, you know, paragon of patriotism, looks her in the eye and asks her, uh, you know, what are these sins you're speaking of? And she responds with a practically a non sequitur. She says, America's the greatest nation in the world, and it has nothing to apologize for. Well, how can we begin to address our problems if that's the way our politicians are thinking about them? And, and and that's really uh, the, the the Reagan legacy. Um, and, and but let's turn to uh, let's turn to uh, to Jimmy Carter because, um, I you know I I, I, I the 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 similarities between the way that Carter was received by uh, liberals uh, and the with the way that Obama was and I think to a certain extent even Clinton frankly um, were uh, really revealing uh, to in my mind in sort of seeing that we there's not much that has, seems to have changed in the way that the the left responds to these things. Talk about 
uh, 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 that. I, uh, that 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 there was like almost a euphoria around Carter. That right, right was largely um, projection. Really, the, the Carter thing um, really, 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 really parallels the Obama thing. I mean, it's really quite uncanny, and what it illustrates is. Um, that old saying that uh, the right falls in line, uh, Republicans fall in line and Democrats fall in love, right? So we want this kind of new blood, this new guy, this fresh wind. And, you know, all the basic candidates who are running for the Democratic nomination are trying to kind of draft off this kind of post-Watergate reform energy and we're outsiders and we're not from Washington or, you know, something like that. And Carter is like just the master of this. And, you know, Carter's a pretty complex guy, right? But one thing he isn't really is a liberal. And um, so and his, his slogan was, I will never lie to you. And there was a really extraordinary article uh, that came out in Harper's early in 1976 when he was kind of like just kind of picking off primaries one by one. It was by a Steve Brill, and it was called The Pathetic Lies of Jimmy Carter. And it basically just like showed how many things he was saying that just weren't true. You know, his his role in the civil rights movement, um, you know, the kind of reforms he made in Georgia. And it really, really reminds me of an article that Ken Silverstein did in Harper's about Obama in 2007, you know, talking about how he was in bed with, uh, you know, agribusiness interests and all this stuff. And, you know, no one wanted to see it, right? We were so eager to have this kind of hero, this outsider, who we could kind of anoint as this kind of new wind, you know? And, you know, the first thing he ex- Carter actually did when he was in the White House was, you know, he kind of he pooped on the labor movement. Yep. And uh, he kind of abandoned Keynesianism by kind of uh, uh, cutting off all these dam projects. Um, you know, there was all this hope when he came into office. We'd have, you know, national health care within a month because we had this you know, colossal Democratic majority and all this stuff. You know, the New Deal agenda was finally going to be completed. But, you know, no one had given this guy a really hard look. And, you know, like I say, there were good things about him, there were bad things about him. But one thing he wasn't was what liberals thought he was. And there are plenty of liberals who didn't want to hear that. What well, what is it about um, the uh, the the Democratic candidates that come in? Because I I remember being in I was in a comedy club uh, the night that Bill Clinton won, and I was you know relieved, but I, I wasn't. Hey Sam, even... I got to uh, I got to go on to my next uh, oh. adventure. Oh okay. Right. <laughs> so we got to wrap it up. Well, all right. maybe one more question. All right. Or you can say one more nice nice thing about my book. Well, if they have time. well, I'll say more nice things whatever. after you go. I mean, so um, okay. so. So in the end, I mean, what uh, when we talk about uh, uh, Reagan's ascendancy, um, what what does it say about the, the the conservative movement? I guess in terms of is it about ideas or is uh, is it about policy or is it ultimately about a a disposition? Hmm. Well, it's all of them, of course. But I think the contribution of this book is to help us understand more uh, the disposition. You know, this kind of blanching of complexity and this kind of instinct of kind of seeing the world in Manichaean terms, uh, which, you know, <laughs> clearly I'm seeing it in my life right now because I'm being attacked just for pointing that out. All right. Well, uh, Rick, we're going to have to do this again when things calm down for you uh, in, 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 in a couple, and that may not be for a couple of months. But uh, thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. The book is great. I'll continue to talk about it after thanks. you go. All I've right. just gotten such amazing support from the progressive community, and I'm so grateful. Thank well, you. It's a, it's a great read. Thanks again, Rick.